My name is Ginny Merrill. Um, in case the slides hadn't clued you in on that. I've been doing research in scleroderma for a few years now and have put together this presentation just about the psychological impacts and the effects of what it's like to live with scleroderma. And a lot of this may be stuff you already know, that you've already experienced. Some of it might be new. Some of it might be hard to hear. But you know, just want to raise some awareness and give you some information about what might happen and what you can do if, if some of these things do start to come up. So I feel like I don't have to tell anybody who is living with this disease that it affects everything. Like it affects all these different parts of your life, right? So these are the areas where we really see it. In the physical, functional, emotional, relational, and spiritual areas, this is what we see. And I think it's really also important to distinguish, well, to think about how we think about illness sometimes. We think about, okay, physically I'm sick. Mentally I'm good. But it's also important to think about the overlap that can happen. We're not completely separate from our mental state. That really affects our body. If you can just think about you know, those days when you wake up and you're just not feeling it, you're not feeling good, you know, how is your mind? Is it sharp and clear and perfect? You know, is your mood stellar? Not always. So I really want us to think about our mind and body being truly connected in this disease and, it, and, and just how it affects each of those things. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background, I started working in scleroderma because my mom is actually a patient, and so she's been diagnosed for 15, 17 years, um, running around here in a yellow volunteer shirt, doing really awesome. But it was really in watching how she you know, lived with this and watching how little information was out there that it became important to me to start to pursue some of this and find out a little bit more information. So in thinking of the areas of impact, the first thing is a physical, right? That feels pretty obvious. Like, I'm sick, of course, I'm going to feel that physically. And so that's going to be, you know, just how, how maybe pain, you know, um, whatever physical symptoms you might be experiencing, nausea, fatigue, those kinds of things. Somebody's functional well-being pertains to your ability to do the activities related to just what you need to do. What you need to do to get through the day, right, to function. We know that having scleroderma impacts that significantly. That includes work roles, being able to work, right? Social roles, being able to fulfill social obligations, those types of things. And of course, it impacts your emotional well-being. If you're not feeling good, probably not feeling you know, good and clear, like I said, or just you know, being able to take everything as it comes, feeling chipper, feeling good, it gets harder, right, when you're not feeling well. And so that actually applies to you know, feeling good. Like if you're feeling emotionally good, that can impact you know, that you're feeling physically well as well. So I want to think a lot about you know, the negative part of that, unfortunately, is when we experience stress. And that's a huge part, and we'll talk about that a lot today. Relationally, we know that you know, if you're in relationships with somebody who is a patient, or if you're related, you know, in a relationship with somebody who is your care provider, it affects that too, right? It can affect your family, it can affect your friends. It's not just you as the patient who's feeling that. It can also impact our spiritual well-being. And so when I talk about spirituality, it, it, it means religion as well, if you have a specific faith that you practice, but it's also, when I use the term spirituality, I'm thinking about, you know, this more broad idea of being connected to something bigger than you are. Okay, how you make meaning, how you find meaning in life. And so we know that being sick can impact our spirituality as well. Okay, so I want to break this down a little bit and talk about the functional effects and how this happens. So this diagnosis impacts your acti activities of daily living, right? And it's from day to day. Like one day maybe you are just solid and you can do all these things that you've always done. Maybe the next day you wake up and it's like, nope, not doing anything. And you don't know when that's coming and when it's not coming, right? So that can change very quickly, even in the same day. So that affects, of course, the patient and then also the people that you interact with as well. So think about your family. You know, sometimes we can think, oh, there's one sick person, so it's only affecting this person, right? And everybody else is just unaffected. We know that's not true. We know that, that this is, if there's a family involved, then it's, this is a piece of the whole family. And so some of those roles that people have within the family change. 
You know, maybe somebody has to take up a little bit more stuff around the house, maybe the cooking or the cleaning, whatever it is. Somebody's going to pick up new roles, and that's going to change balance a little bit within the family. Work roles can change. Same thing happens at work. You know, if your job is to sit and type all day, and you work in one of these offices where it's like 60 degrees in the summer, and you actually have to go outside to defrost into the 100 degree heat and defrost, right? Well, you're going to be affected. Your illness is maybe such that you know, it's whatever. You know, it's hard to type. It's cold. Work productivity can go down. That's going to affect the system. That can also affect your own self-esteem and your ability to uh, feel productive, right? It can also, you know, it impacts recreation, education. And one of the big things that I, when I speak with people about this is that it affects future possibilities. So if you think back to maybe before you were diagnosed or just have a little look back into your past and think about, okay, what was my plan? You know, I was going to do this, and then I was going to do this next, and I was going to do that. And I bet that nobody in here, like, on that to-do list was like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get diagnosed with scleroderma. That sounds great. You know, let me do that. So when that happens, that takes your plans way off course, right? It changes a lot of what you were going to do, okay? Maybe it just derails it a little bit, and maybe it's a full-on right turn. I can't even see where I was going before. And so it's important to think about those future possibilities and how they change. Sometimes, like I said, they go away completely, and sometimes they just take a little detour. So this can be experienced in people very differently. Sometimes I've, you know, I've spoken with people who wanted to have a family, wanted to have children, and because of their diagnosis, they couldn't. So suddenly that's off the table, and that's really painful. I've spoken with other people. One woman, she was diagnosed, and she was like, you know what? She f said that she felt like her time shrunk, and she started feeling pressured, like, okay, I have to do something now. And the way that she made meaning of that was to go back to school, and she became a nurse. She, be she wanted to learn about her own health, and she wanted to be able to help other people. And she had been a marketing person before that, so it was a really dramatic career change. But that's how she shifted her future possibilities. So sometimes that can be positive, sometimes that can be negative. It really just depends. And because you know, every time we see somebody who is diagnosed, it looks differently, it's hard to say that you know, this is going to happen for every single person and this is gonna, how it's going to happen, right? Because even with this disease, we have no idea how it's going to look. And the same thing with some of the psychological impacts. We don't really know how that's going to look all the time. So let's talk a little bit about emotional effects. And by let's talk, I mean let me talk, obviously, since I've got the mic here. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen because of this disease. And these are the things that are really, um, when, I'm doing, when I've done my research, this is the stuff that's come up. So guilt comes up pretty often. People start to feel bad because they can't do what they used to do. They can't contribute. It feels bad not to be able to like pull your own weight, right? And so it's important to find other ways to do that. But guilt is extremely common to feel. And I really share some of these pieces to, to help normalize some of the things that you might have gone through, might be going through, and what you're feeling. Again, not everybody is going to experience these things in the same way, but these are, these are some common things. So it's also, people can feel guilty because they can't, maybe you have, your husband loves to travel and you can't do that as easily anymore, okay? That can add some stress to the relationship then, right? So it's, it's, guilt is just very common to feel. Loss, there are a million things to think about when we think about loss. Remember that person that you were going to be with all your plans? That person's different now and you can mourn that loss. It's very common to feel loss for that. You know, it may be a very it, literal loss. You may have lost somebody that you loved. Um, it could be a loss of status, a loss of job, loss of a paycheck. Okay, there's a lot of things that you're going to lose, or you could lose and mourn. Hostility comes up because, guess what? When we aren't feeling good, we're not as sunshiny as we normally might be, right? So 
we might, our fuse shortens a little bit, we might be a little irritable, and that's how it comes out. And unfortunately, generally, when we are feeling cranky, like who are we cranky at? The people that are closest to us, right? So it's like whoever's in this radius, you know, is gonna get it today. And very normal, natural thing to have happen. People feel disappointment, they feel fear and uncertainty. Again, this is an unpredictable disease, it can change day to day. So dealing with that becomes very difficult, or can that kind of ambiguity. Self-esteem is certainly impacted. You know, people who have more pain seem to have um, more, they tend to have lower self-esteem. So also people that have hand involvement or facial involvement, we see, tend to see a little bit lower self-esteem in people who have that kind of involvement. Body image, very much related to that. And then this idea of invisible versus visible disability. And I mentioned my mom at the beginning of this because honestly this is how all my research started is that she and I were going to dinner or lunch one day. And you know, she was feeling like she couldn't really walk that day so she has the little the disabled placard right in the car. We pull up, we park, no big deal. And we get out and to look at her, she doesn't look sick at all. And I started noticing people like staring at us and I'm thinking, mom, what's, what are they looking at? Well, it was because she didn't look sick. Why is she in that parking space? And I'm seeing some heads nodding, so I think this is probably not the only time that's happened. But it's a very interesting thing to think about. You know, if you don't look sick, how are you going to get people to believe you? You know, you may have had the experience of having to try to convince even a physician, like, I'm sick, I don't feel good. Maybe people in your life, they doubt you or they don't believe you, and that can be really, really scary and hard to deal with as well. Sometimes when you can see sickness, you get believed a little more easily, and that doesn't really feel fair either. It's just a very, a very tricky piece of, of what this is. It's also tricky because, you know, if you do have an invisible disability, you are sick but you can't tell, then you might, maybe at work, you're trying to work to hide that. Maybe you're wearing gloves, oh, don't worry about it, just a little cold, right? So that people don't see your fingers turning blue or blanching or whatever they're doing. Actually hiding that can make you actually experience more anxiety in some people. So trying to manage that, to hide that identity, can actually result in an increase in anxiety. So I touched on this next piece a little bit. When we talk about relation, relational effects, like what happens within relationships when somebody gets diagnosed? And we know a whole lot can happen. I mentioned a little bit about hostility, right? Whoever is close might, might feel some of that hostility more than the people who are a little bit farther away. It's important to think about when you're in a relationship with somebody who's been diagnosed with scleroderma is, you know, this is, at some point, it's new to everybody. And if you think about when, before you were diagnosed, you're autonomous, right? You're independent. You can take care of what you need to take care of. And as the disease progresses, you might be in a position where you're a little bit more dependent. And so the relationship can feel off balance. And that can be hard for both people. Because you as patient, you want to pull your weight. Right, and sometimes you just can't. And then as caregiver, that's a tough position too because they're working to balance a lot as well. So this is gonna introduce or can introduce a lot of strain into relationships. And unfortunately, there is research out there that shows that sometimes after somebody is diagnosed, there's an increased divorce rate. Sometimes people do leave. So this is a very real uh, piece of, of stress that can happen within the relationship. There's certainly, you know, hostility, sensitivity, irritability, those things come up, and a lot of time that's associated with pain. You're not feeling good, that's how it's gonna come out. Challenges with intimacy, you know, especially affected by pain, physical manifestations, right? It can get very, very difficult to remain intimate with your partner, especially if you're both exhausted, right? That's very hard to overcome. Now, the doubt piece comes back to that idea of, I can't see it, so maybe I don't really know if you're sick. I've talked to a lot of people, they say, you know what, my, my husband just doesn't believe me. Like, he asked me to do something and I can't do it, and he thinks I'm using it as an excuse. And that's a really hard position to be in. So it's important to be able to open those lines of communication and talk about, you know, honesty and saying, you know what, I, I really don't feel well, and if I could do this, I would. 
financial stress. This is one of those things that is, you know, it, I, I call it from the category of duh research. People who have less money tend to be more stressed when it comes to maintaining, maintaining the treatment of an illness, okay? And of course, you know, those are the big things. When people come to couples therapy, it's generally about intimacy or it's about money. And so those aren't gonna go away post-diagnosis. Those things are gonna remain and perhaps even just amp up a little bit. You know, I, these are mostly negative things here that I'm talking about, but I've also spoken with people who have had some really positive experiences relationally. And one woman was telling me that she really figured out who her friends were after her diagnosis. Like, there was a friend thinning. Like, some people went away. She lost some people, but she's like, you know what? The people that stuck around, these are it. These are the real people that care about me and want to support me. But that friend thinning can be really, really hard. People that you thought you could rely on, they, they filter off, they go away. And that can be for any number of reasons, any number of reasons. So, you know, it's important to remember the positives as well. And as I say that, I'm going to pop over to some more negatives, and I apologize for that. But this is a really, really critical thing to think about, is that scleroderma patients are four and a half times more likely to receive a psychiatric diagnosis than the general population, okay? It's very common, and that's a pretty significant, significant thing. And these are the diagnoses that we tend to see. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about them. So major depressive disorder, these are the things that you know, anytime you see an antidepressant commercial and they're asking, you know, are you tired, do you feel sad, is there a cloud following you around, you know, what are those things that make up depression, that's really what it is. It's not being able to uh, feel pleasure in activities that you used to enjoy. It's having a depressed mood for, for a few weeks. It can be weight gain, weight loss, sleep disturbance. Um, appetite disturbance, un unable to concentrate, fatigue. What else does that sound like? Kind of sounds like having scleroderma, doesn't it? Maybe you can't sleep, can't eat, feeling tired. So how do you know if it's depression or if you are just, yeah, just feeling your illness, exactly. And so the things that you want to look for are more like the sadness that lasts a really long time or, you know, Honestly, the diagnosis says two weeks, so if you get into feeling really sad for two weeks, feelings of worthlessness, recurrent thoughts of death, those are the things that are gonna signify depression, uh, more so than, those, than the symptoms of scleroderma. And again, we see higher levels of depressive symptoms with people who have um, hand involvement or, or facial involvement, and also with, um, with GI, um, like esophageal hypomotility we see increase in depression in that as well. So it's really, really important because of this increase that you talk to your doctors about this as well. Depression is a piece of this, and because it is more common, it's just something to keep an eye on if that's ringing any bells for you. Um, you know, it's also really important to think about genetics, okay? So if you have a history of depression in your family, it does run in families. So attend to that and be aware of it in light of that as well. Same thing with anxiety. Anxiety, you know, that happens over the course of six months. If you have excessive anxiety or worry for more days than you didn't, that would merit a, a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. And again, there is lots to be anxious about, so let me normalize that, okay? There really is. Um, and, you know, this is where we're thinking, you know, it's hard to control the worry, you feel restless, you're on edge, hard to concentrate, muscle tension, sleep disturbance. Again, what is that kind of sounding like, okay? So there will always be overlap. And if you were anxious before your diagnosis, you think it's going to go away? Nah. My it's going to go, go up a little bit even. A lot of times that, that definitely happens. If we're already an anxious person, we're going to keep being an anxious person, and we just got a lot more material to be anxious about. So it's important to you know, keep track of that and monitor that. And you know, there are a lot of, there are actually really good meds out there as well. I know I'm always hesitant to, to talk about meds because I see you know, the piles of meds that people end up taking to manage all the aspects of this disease. So there is good medical treatment, pharmacological treatment for this. We're also going to talk some, about some non-pharmacological ways to deal with both anxiety and depression.
okay? Adjustment disorder is very commonly seen. That's just if you have, you know, within three months of the onset of a stressor, you, do you feel some emotional or behavioral symptoms around that. Dysthymic disorder is it's like a low-grade depression that lasts about two years, so that's more of a long-term thing. And we also see somatization disorder. And that's very tricky because, let's listen to these symptoms. Um, pain, gastrointestinal involvement, sexual side effects, neurological side effects. That sounds familiar too, right? So that's, that one's really very tricky because it does also sound like a recipe for scleroderma to some extent. But these are real things that, but they don't have a basis in, in the physical. These are things that have you know, somaticized so that we're feeling them in our body. So those are the most common diagnoses for people who are living with scleroderma. So let's talk a little bit about how we're gonna deal with all these things. There's lots of different ways that we can do this, and education is the first one. So guess what, everybody in this room is getting educated. So yay, we're already on our way. Pain management, you know, if you experience chronic pain, you know, doctors, therapists can also help uh, mediate this, can help you learn relaxation techniques, or there's also pharmacological intervention with this as well, of course. Stress management, um, we'll talk about that in detail. That's gonna involve a lot, of, a lot of different things that you can do through your day that include things like problem solving. Support groups are very important. Most people are in areas where they have them. It's also important to make sure that you balance, you know, in your support group, you're dealing with both empathy and, and dealing with maybe trying to focus on the positive a little bit when you can. I hear a lot of people say that they're scared to go to support groups sometimes because maybe it feels very negative or it's scary. And so being able to balance empathy with what you need to get done and, the, and what you need to provide for people becomes very important. And then of course, psychotherapy, and that comes in all different ranges, you know, forms and fashions, individual, group, family, all shown to be very, very helpful in helping people deal with some of these symptoms. So always keep that in your back pocket as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of these things more specifically. It's very important that you can control what you can control. A lot of stuff is completely out of your control, right? You can't really control what's going on with your disease, what happens next. What you can do is control things like what you're eating. You know, are you sleeping? How much are you sleeping? If you can exercise, exercising to the extent you can. Avoiding things like alcohol, drugs, and smoking. Those are the things that we can control, right, that are going to make an impact in how we feel. So if we can choose good health, we're gonna be in better shape than if we don't. Also, you know, remaining compliant with your medication, making sure you're taking what you're supposed to be taking, you're gonna be in better shape. Those are the things that we can control. It's also really important to try to give ourselves a break a little bit, improving your attitude toward yourself. So, you know, this is something I talked about yesterday in the caregiver's presentation, but it's really important. And especially if one of those, we're one of those highly anxious type A people and we really like to have control of things because control feels really nice sometimes because it's predictable. Well, we know that we can't always do that. Sometimes that can be really hard. We know things are gonna change. We just know that. But man, do we try to resist it. Like, I don't want that to happen, so I'm just going to try to will it not to happen. But, you know, things change. And so it can be important to change your mindset to th mind, you know, just to think about how can I accept and expect change? I know that it's gonna come, so how am I gonna work to do that? It's also important to forgive yourself. We can hold ourselves to really high standards. And maybe we wanted to get up and do 20 things before noon, right? Well, is that realistic? Maybe not. Maybe we're gonna learn that five is Five is really doable for a good day, and I'm gonna feel good about those five things that I can get to. It's important to establish realistic and reachable goals, okay? If we're setting goals that we'll never reach, that doesn't feel good. So if we can lower our expectations, lower our number of goals, get to our you know, must-dos as opposed to our want-tos first, and then if we have some extra energy, we do some of those things that we just want to, that can be really important. It's also important to share with other people. In a good support network is extremely critical in helping people navigate illness. 
having good people in your life, not the people that, you know, that you leave, a, you know, um, maybe you leave lunch afterwards and you're like, why did I just go to lunch with that person? That doesn't feel good. Okay, who are those people that bring positive things into your life? How do you get more of them? Who are they? And spending more time with them. That can be really important. It'd be important to look for those people actually outside of your family as well. Like yes, if you have a partner, rely on them, but also look for people outside the relationship to connect with and get support from and be able to support them. It feels really great when you are in the position of generally having to rely on somebody else to be able to be there for someone else. It does wonders for self-esteem to be able to be there for somebody else. It's also very critical to make time for yourself, and that can feel easy to say and hard to do, right? So sometimes people's hours are just booked. There's not time to do everything you want to. But learning to make yourself a priority, even if it's for 30 minutes, doing something, trying to build that into your day, whatever it is you like doing, do that. Build more of it in as much as you can. Some other things that research tells us that work in helping us reduce stress are things like muscle relaxation, guided imagery, biofeedback, um, hypnosis, yoga, mindfulness, all these things a professional can help you engage, engage in. There are also stress management strategies that can help you reduce stress, which are really very helpful. Um, one of those is, like I said, to establish realistic goals. Another is to try to plan major events as much as you can. I know we can't always have total control over everything, but it's really good not to try to make huge decisions when a lot is going on. So practicing good decision making. You know, if you have to make a pro and con list or you have to make a to-do list and really weed out what needs to get done and what doesn't, to take some time to do that. Another thing that we can learn to do is to be resilient. And resilience is just our ability to bounce back from something tough. And that's not something that you either have or you don't have, it's actually something that you can learn, which I think is really very cool. So, you know, that doesn't mean, if you're resilient, that doesn't mean that you don't go through hard times. It just means that you have coping strategies that help you get through them. And the number one contributing factor, the main thing that people who are resilient have in common are actually caring and supportive relationships. That ends up being what's most important. They also have the ability to set realistic goals and meet them. They have a positive view of themselves. They have self-confidence. They're skilled in communication. And they're good at m regulating their emotions. When I say regulating emotions, that doesn't mean not feeling anything. That just means actually being able to experience them and move through them and knowing that sometimes if you are having really intense emotions, then maybe that's not the right time to be feeling it. Maybe you know, you're in the middle of the supermarket and you think you're really just, you can't keep it together anymore and you need to step out, okay? Totally okay, totally okay to do. It's just about recognizing and regulating. So another really handy trick that I wanna talk about today is social interaction skills training. And I. Uh, really, a colleague pointed this out to me. She used to work in the burn unit at Parkland Hospital, and so she worked with a lot of burn patients who were dealing with you know, either scars on their face or very evident scars on their hands. And so this psychology of disfigurement came out of uh, a, a man named James Partridge, and he's a burn survivor who was burned over 50% of his body, including his face and hands. And he wrote a book, it's called Changing Faces. So I really recommend it to people who have um, you know, facial involvement or just outward signs of the illness. And he talks about his experience of how people respond to his change or his physicality, how he looks. And he's come out with some really, really nice, um, nice things to do in order to deal with that. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So what we know is that there's, we have an attractiveness bias in, in our society. We actually attribute more positive things to people who we consider more attractive, and we attribute negative things to people who we find less attractive. And it's completely arbitrary, but that seems to be, that seems to be how it works. And so it can be really, really tough when you're first, trying to make a first impression on somebody. They get really difficult, especially you know, if we do have this outward 
you know, the outward um, appearance of being ill or having, having scleroderma. You know, he experienced visual and verbal assaults. He talked about like, walking through a store and you know, a child pointing out, like, oh, look, a monster um, pointing at him. So it was very dramatic, very hard um, for him to go through. And so why do people re respond that way? There's a lot of different reasons. Sometimes they just don't get it. There's something called like the just world hypothesis where we believe that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. So if you did something, then you did something, or you, something bad happened to you, it's because you did something bad. When in reality, that's not the case at all. But people believe that because that protects us. You know, I'm a good person, so nothing is going to happen to me. I'm going to get nothing but good because I'm putting good out there. That's just a little, you know, mental gymnastics of, of trying to tell us that we're going to be okay and nothing bad is going to happen to us, when the fact is bad stuff happens to really great people all the time. Okay. So one of the things that they talk about in this book, which is I think is just really, really, really interesting, is a scar, a scar experiment that they did whereby they had some volunteers, psychologists are a little tricky, we're not afraid to do that, brought some people into a room and put like a, uh, like a Hollywood makeup scar on their face, okay? And showed, showed it to them, held up a little mirror, you can see the scar, there it is. And then they asked the people, okay, we're gonna send you out into the world and we want you to come back and tell us how people reacted to you. And they're like, okay, cool, we can do that. And so, they're like, the, then the people, the makeup artist was like, okay, well, let me put a little more of fixant on you. Well, what they did was actually remove this Hollywood makeup scar, okay? But then they didn't show the person the mirror again. So the person goes out into the world thinking they have a scar on their face, and what do you think they said when they came back? Yeah, people treated them badly. People were staring. People weren't opening doors when they normally would, or you know, people were whispering about them when the reality was there was nothing there. So there is a lot to be said about our perception of what's out there. Sometimes we end up seeing what we want to see or what we think we'll see. Yes, ma'am. You're right, yeah, maybe feeling a little less confident and not being able to project that like they normally would. Yeah, I think that's a really good, good possibility. For sure. So that same kind of thing can apply with scleroderma as well, of course. And so people have various reactions when, when outward involvement starts, starts to show. And people can withdraw or avoid. So maybe, you know what, I'm not going to the store today. Like, I'm not ever going to the store again. I'm going to withdraw, staying home. I don't want to have to deal with other people. I don't want to answer questions. I don't want to have to be a spokesperson for scleroderma today. Don't want to have to hand out the card, right? It's tiring. So isolation is one way to deal with that. Another way is aggression. And so, you know, somebody says, you know, somebody maybe points out you're wearing gloves in the supermarket, right? And you're like, yeah, I am just wearing gloves. Just let me wear gloves, right? So you feel a little bit of anger behind that. What we want to do is foster a more proactive and assertive way to deal with that so that we're not isolating and so that we're not being aggressive. And we're going to talk about how to do that. So this is a fun little mnemonic of social skills interaction training. And this is, how, this is how this works. And this is something that you do beforehand, before you go out into the world. You start practicing some of these things. That makes it a little bit easier. So the reassurance piece is about you know, just reassuring people. When you can connect to people, either through like a smile or a nod or a wink, and they see you know, your humanity, that you're a person too, that puts people at ease, and that can help reassure them. Effort means something like what you were referring to a little bit, of like projecting yourself confidently into the world, okay? It can also, um, yeah, putting a little bit of energy into your appearance, because we do have that attractiveness bias. That's out there as well. Being assertive becomes really important. To you know, make your point directly, um, but also politely. So if somebody you know, asks right out or you see somebody steering, you can say something like, you know, don't worry, it's not contagious, you know, or I'm okay, you know, I'm fine. Um, if you start seeing that, uh, those are the kind of reactions that people are having. It's also okay to say, you know what, I don't really want to talk about it. If you're in the grocery store, you're just trying to get some milk. 
okay? You want to run in, you want to get out. You don't want to have to talk about all these things. It's okay to say that and to not do it. You totally are allowed to do that. It's important to try to have courage, and I know that's really hard to do, but to really challenge, challenge yourself to be brave and do these things, even if you're feeling nervous. People have told me that it helps them to have a few little jokes in their back pocket. If they notice somebody staring or uh, something like that, they'll say, um, somebody told me, what did they tell me? Um, oh, you should have seen the other guy, right? So they had facial involvement and they noticed somebody staring and she was like, you should have seen the other guy. And then there's a little bit of a laugh. Again, we're introducing that humanity into the relationship and it puts the other person at ease. And I know that sounds like we're doing a lot of work to get somebody else in the right place, and you may not always feel like doing that, and that's totally fine. You don't have to. These are just some ways to deal with this. Over there, that means just finding a distraction. If, you don't, if you're not in the mood to talk about it, then guess what? How about them cowboys? How about them whoever? Let's talk about something else. Find something that's distracting. It's also okay to have some understanding and share a little bit of education. If you do have the energy for it, and you do have your little what is scleroderma card, and you want to tell somebody and educate them about that, go for it. Again, that's not your job every day, but it's certainly something you can do. And trying again means that we can try all these things and sometimes we can just still mess up, but having the courage to try them again and, and really challenging ourselves to keep, just keep getting out there. So when we break it down like that, I like to encourage people to do this, to have three things to do if someone stares at you. Just have them ready to go in your back pocket. You know, maybe that's the nod, wink, wave, say hello. Um, have two things to say if somebody asks, what's wrong or what happened? I have scleroderma, this is what it is. Don't worry, I'm not contagious, it's okay. Um, and then remind yourself, think of one thing to think of if someone turns away from you or you feel like somebody's staring at you and it doesn't feel good. Remind yourself of something positive, okay? You know, they don't know how to respond. They, they just don't know. And being a little bit forgiving of them as well, but keeping yourself protected in the meantime also. So here are just some final coping strategies that I wanna talk about before we start to get into some questions. Having self-awareness is very important. Being able to ask yourself, what is going on for me right now? What am I feeling? Why am I feeling that? Um, it's, like, it's like having a check engine light. Like when that comes on, what do you do? You like go to the mechanic and they hook, you, hook it up to a computer and they figure out what's going on, right? So when you feel your check engine light go on, you know, take a second, figure out what that is. What do I need to adjust? What's happening for me right now? If you know, you're trying to tell yourself something if you feel like you're feeling something, okay? So take some time to pay attention for that, to that. Boundary setting is also really very important. And this seems like, again, a very simple premise, but something that's very hard to enact. So how can I achieve balance in my life? Am I doing too much of something? Am I not doing enough of, of the other stuff? Are my expectations realistic? You know, am I giving too much to certain parts of my life that aren't really returning what I need them to? And thinking about, you know what, how can I set limits so that I'm protecting myself and I'm taking care of myself, not just in a physical way, but also emotionally. Stress management, am I adding to stress in my life or am I reducing it? If I'm adding, how can I quit that? And how can I manage the stress that I am feeling? Self-care becomes super, super important. How do I make time for myself? What is it that really recharges me? What do I love to do? And am I doing that? Do I have enough of that in my life? And if not, time to figure out what it is that does recharge you and put a little bit more of that in your life. And sometimes that changes after diagnosis because you can't do the same stuff that you did before, right? So maybe it's something new that you have to find and figure out what can I do more of? And again, finally, social support. Who do I count on? Who's there for me? How do I balance that out so I'm not asking one person to do, to do everything? Who can I reach out to on various levels? And who can I be there for as well? You know, who can I feel like I can take care of as well? <laughs>